Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and I'm back today with Mariana Kaplan. Um, I interviewed Mariana about a year ago, and she's one of my favorite spiritual authors. I'll, I'll read a short bio of her here. Um, she is a licensed psychotherapist, a lifelong yogi, or yogini as the case may be, and the author of seven books in the fields of psychology and spirituality, including Eyes Wide Open, Cultivating Discernment on the Spiritual Path, The Guru Question, The Perils and Awards of Choosing a Spiritual Teacher, and Halfway Up the Mountain, The Error of Premature Claims to Enlightenment. Um, she is currently working with nine interns conducting living research on the intersection of yoga and Western psychology and is in the process of writing a book, a workbook, an academic article on the subject. And that's the subject that we're going to talk about quite a bit today, yoga and psychology, although we might veer off here and there into other things. And One thing I just want to say about your books, Mariana, that if I had to sum them up in a, a sentence, I would say they're all about honesty and not not BSing yourself about your own degree of progress about your teacher about anything just sort of learning to be truthful and honest and and kind of um, your books your books make it clear how how valuable that is and how useful and and how deluding yourself if if you're really sincere about spiritual progress is not a very helpful tactic thanks Rick I uh, that's a Kind of compliments I I think I've I've spent my years, you know, wor working toward because that's always been my goal. And of course I I had a teacher named Lee Lazowick. I have a teacher, but he he passed on two years ago, and mm -hmm. and that's that's what he that's what he was in the world. Right? He was a a stand for for a spirituality that was completely committed and uncompromised, but no bullshit, right? No extras. Mm -hmm. um, he really, really uh, taught us and kept us close to the ground. And so to have been able to, to convey that through books is, is really an honor. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, I think of the word disillusionment and I think of it as having a positive connotation because ob obviously the whole enlightenment game is all about coming out of illusion and so we want to be disillusioned, you know. And uh, sometimes that hits us in the conventional sense of the word. We get disillusioned with our teacher or with this or with that, but it's a growing up process in which we're actually getting more clear about things. Yeah, I mean, disillusionment I, in, in Halfway Up the Mountain, which I think is the book that you and I originally connected around, there was a, a chapter on the, on the path of the, the actual sadhana of disillusionment. And the paradox of disillusionment is, I think of it as a, an incredibly, like, happy, successful, healthy aspect of the path, which paradoxically usually feels really bad when it's happening, right? So it's a mark of success, it's progress, we want it, we court it, and it often doesn't feel good when it's happening. Yeah, and for some, sometimes people let that really trip them up. You know, they get disillusioned with a teacher or with their own progress or something, and they give up on the whole thing. I would encourage them to just take that as a, a lesson, take it in stride, and, you know, keep on moving because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. tunnel. Yeah, and, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about, about yoga here specifically and, and psychology, and, and in Patanjali's 196 Yoga Sutras, there's actually a, a sutra later, later on that, that addresses you know, the point on the spiritual path when the student has made a lot of progress and is suddenly getting stuck and disillusioned that they're not able to make further progress, what do we do then? We, we, we hold fortitude, and it's that it's actually marked as a moment on the path, hmm. and that's a, a, a moment on the path to, to stay and cultivate fortitude, faith, you know, company, study, patience, because hmm. that's, that's an actual moment where we can step back because it's disheartening or we can in psychological terms stay with the impasse and and on the other side of the impasse if you work skillfully with it there actually is it gives way to 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 what's next huh i remember also something from the yoga sutras where he talks about long dedicated practice in other words just mm. really really sticking to it for a long time yeah, uh, my, my yoga teacher, Bhavani Maki in Kauai, she used to drill that in. And it's a beautiful one because it says, 
you know, long, consistent, and I don't think consistent has to mean seven days a week, you know, consistent over many, many years, dedicated practice done with sincerity. Yeah. Definite, definitely um, yields fruit and ground, grounds us on the path. Mm-hmm. Which sort of flies in the face of the popular notion that you're already there and all you have to do is give up the search and <laughs> you're done. But, uh, so much for that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that, that is not untrue. Yeah, on it, some level. It, right, on some level. But, but talk to like a sincere, married, 30-year-old, you know, 30-year practitioner, married or, you know, struggling with relationship practitioner with some health issues or who has had a teenager or an illness and it just doesn't fly in the way that on our first or second trip to India you know when we we read Ram Dass's book well before he had a stroke mm-hmm. and we, we walk around talking about that it, it just means something different yeah it's right it, 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 it many of these things they're they're ultimately true and and yet um, nobody is exempt from uh, I don't. I mean, I don't know if you even want to be exempt, but from from the laws, not only of duality, but of development, of mm-hmm. human development. Yeah. And human development can be articulated in karmic terms. Um, you know, if, if if that's the way we want to talk about it, but 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 everybody goes through a process of human development, and including the enlightened teachers, right? That's a recurrent theme in these interviews. Um, some people are sick of hearing me talk about it, but um. <laughs> I I feel it's really important because, well, for all the reasons we've just been discussing about sort of not deluding yourself on the path and so on, but it's the way it is. And, you know, I, I, I have yet to, sp- after 150 some odd interviews, I have yet to find anyone that I feel is 100% finished. And I usually ask them point blank about that kind of question. And, they, and the more, I'd say, mature ones I always say, it's still getting deeper for me, you know. It's like an exploration. I don't know where it'll end, but there's always more, you know. And there's something, obviously, which you discover at a certain point which never changes, and that's fine, but it's the kind of the interface of that with the rest of life that knows no end in, in terms of refinement and salt and deepening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, Patanjali seems to be... Uh, present in our interview, right, and his, in, in these beautiful, um, in this iconography, he sits on this, on this bed of snakes that's called Ananta, and Ananta is, is endlessness, mm. and, and, right, the path is, is endless, and I, again, I think we want it to be, and, and I had, we've spoken about this in other moments, but my, my teacher's teacher was, was one of the saints of old, Yogi Ram Srek Kumar, the kind which we find very few of it anymore, but I had, I had the, I mean, I had the, the great fortune of, of being close with him when I was a little bit too young to really get what, what I was experiencing, but old enough to, to feel it and think about it for the next <laughs> 20 years. And, and, and what was so beneficial about meeting him at, at such a young age was that, that he, he was a, a, an enlightened man who, I mean, he never talked in those terms. But but he had like stumbled into his enlightenment 50 years before I met him, mm. and he never ever stopped. Mm. And it was like a process of velo- It actually seemed to increase in velocity in his case. So by the time by the time I met him, you know, he was just a a comet falling falling through the sky into endlessness. Mm-hmm. And the talk of enlightenment, or you know, we're already there, or you don't have to do anything. I mean, that would be for him like, you know, a baby kind of fiddling around with the first little like toys, kind of like that. I mean, it was just the the conversation was in an in infinite. I mean, there it was it it was a uh, an example of, of the endlessness, mm-hmm. and of course. If we don't really take that into account, at least at the level of contemplation, and eventually through experience, then we miss out. We miss out on what life has to offer, which is an endless, right? An endless deepening, changing, hopefully maturation. And that's right. That's that's what it is. Yeah. And and who would want to stop at a bunch of 
great enlightenment experiences. We miss out on on all the juice and hey. lessons, right? And intimacy and. A friend of mine posted a Facebook comment today in which she said, uh, my New Year's resolution for 2013 is to give up seeking. And I said, okay, I said, well, seeking, you don't have to give up seeking because the, the sense of sort of a empty, craving, seeking sort of thing is going to fall off naturally when there's enough finding, but there's going to be no end to finding if you think of it in terms of discovery and exploration and uh, un deeper unfoldment. So, you know, so don't try to give up anything, just... <laughs> Keep on keeping on. <laughs> Wake up, brush your teeth. <laughs> See who's in your life that needs attending to. Yeah. So let's talk about yoga and psychology. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh? You you can lead the way on that, and I'll just yeah. ask you questions. Yeah. So so Yogi Ramsar Kumar, although he wasn't a practitioner of, of asana, or maybe he was. For all I know, he he was a great 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 yogi. So I, I kind of I stumbled into yoga almost um, uh, well from from the back door. I just you know stumbled into the greatest yogi I'll probably ever meet in my entire life and had no idea who he was. And I started studying asana many years later and 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 studying psychology really my 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 whole adult life. And and you know an experience that you and I share in in different ways you through the show and all of your life experiences that I, I, I have talked to a lot of people on the spiritual path. I mean, a lot of people on the spiritual path and I've talked to them in, in confidence and in intimacy. And, and I thought when I wrote halfway up the mountain about premature claims to enlightenment, I was going to put that aside and get on to, to bigger and brighter subjects. And I, I, I could not have predicted that 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 was the beginning of of almost being a receptacle for 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 the truth of people's experience on the path and of teachers and of the students of the teachers and of the consorts of the teachers and of the ex-wives and of the people who have the kids with the teachers and and of the teachers and their struggles with um, clinical depression and anxiety attacks and where that intersects with psychiatry and and what that does to their self-esteem and not only how are they integrating it, but how can they present it in a way that supports their students and, and yet, yet allows them to be authentic and right, endless. And I, I honestly find it beautiful because we, you know, somewhere in our hearts, we start the path, we say we want truth, we intuit it, but we have no idea what it is. And then if, if we live, as, as we were saying with that Yoga Sutra, with sincerity, you know, and consistent effort over time, the path itself and practice itself, as it should, bears, bears fruit in us. And so, so, so coming back to yoga, I was thinking this morning when I was but thinking about... Let me about just interject a question here. So mm -hmm. if, if it bears fruit, wouldn't we eventually be moving beyond all this yucky stuff and and uh, and have you found examples of teachers who uh, have kind of risen to a level of clarity and integration where all the sorts of uh, human dramas you just alluded to um, have been transcended and things have gotten really smooth or are there no uh, or, and if not then you know one might ask well what is the point of all this I thought we were supposed to somehow become really ha happy integrated psychologically healthy people through spiritual practice well it's a good question I I want to I want to take a minute with that when you say that I I two teachers popped into mind and and they both sit on different different polarities and I, I like to hold opposites that's right again yoga that's that's the idea is is holding learning to hold opposites in the same space so first, I think of someone like Arnaud de Jardin, who was a you know great spiritual Advaita master in France. He died about a year and a half ago, a year after my teacher. He was his best friend. I knew him for a long time. And Arnaud, through the course of life, you know, when he died in his 80s, I think he was an integrated man, and I I saw a little drama in, in his life. Besides maybe, the maybe his testosterone had just fizzled out at that age. <laughs> I mean, 80 years of experience, but he had, he had been through, you know, marriages and 
dramas with his children and his students and his organization then a divorce and and a big affair with a movie star that he worked out with his teacher in the context of a spiritual life early on and and many things and then and then illness right so so the drama doesn't end because then you have to figure out how to die and so there's someone like Arno he was unusual integrated and and again we don't really know what people right. struggle with in their inner worlds because oftentimes we we think we see these examples of, of integrated people and then you know I get the manuscripts first you know of the of the next expose and the information comes in sometimes confidentially and sometimes you know through, through well, how, about, how about that yogi whose name I can't pronounce who is your teacher's teacher uh, I mean I guess he smokes cigarettes or something but would you consider him to have been an example of someone who was free of human foibles or or is there really no uh no such example ever well i i it's it's interesting i don't think he's the he, there's there's the when when you deal with the saints and i think it's it's interesting because when we think that we're going to be a saint it's sort of like thinking that we're going to be president. I mean, one one person is, you know, every every four or eight years in, in in the whole world. And sometimes people are are become saints. But when we compare ourselves to the saints, I I don't think it's um I don't think it's that useful. I mean, he he was actually doing some something else. Hmm. So maybe he was free of human drama, but he wasn't entirely human. You know, that same period in 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 Tiruvannamalai. Which is the popular, you know, neo advaita hangout in in India these days? There was a guy called Ben Shwami, and Ben Shwami was an apparently enlightened man who was in this samadhi state, and he lived on a bench. He, he never moved from his bench. I think he peed on his bench, and they had a whole system, and people would come and get high from being with him. I mean, maybe he was above human drama, but he wasn't inside of it either. Yeah. And and most of us. Um, most of us not only don't want to be on the bench, I mean, we want to participate in life, and and we want and we want to integrate, right? And we want to refine our relationships, and we want to love more deeply. I mean, I think at this point in my life that that experiences of intimacy that that I might have in in love or with my child, you know, new and deeper heart openings in a relational context. They're more interesting to me than than a samadhi state because I actually think at this point that they're a little harder to come by as well. I mean, you do enough spiritual practice, and you know now the drugs are are quite popular and even integrated. So people do ayahuasca or they do what they do, and and we can get the states, we can get lots of them, but a relational state of of intimacy. Right of which there's endless flavors, or with a client, right moments of of love and and opening. Those those are great mystical states. They're just relational, and those continue to open and change, and often are directly related with the depth of our own um, inner work and interpersonal work. Hmm. And they're they're states that that we long for because I think we're we're both at a stage of life where. I run into a lot of old friends who were in India forever or are, or, and but but many people ended up sacrificing relationship or family for the path. Right? Many, and and they they have all the states, and they have some abidance in the states. But the longing for for human love, and contact, right, and touch, and sharing, and giving. Right, they're they're just as relevant as 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 these other desires, and those happen within the human domain. Yeah, so I guess if I could summarize what you said, you, you know, if if you're one of these rare souls who can live on a bench, um, uh, and you know, we see examples of this in India ever since reading Yogananda's book and so on, uh, then we might you might seem to be kind of above uh, the ordinary um, conflicts and messiness that characterizes life in general, uh, although it would be interesting to transplant such a person into an ordinary life if hypothetically you could do that and, and see, see what ended up happening. But for the, for the most of us, that's not going to happen anyway. It's a moot point. And so 
the complexities and conflicts and frictions of, of day-to-day life from relationships to health to finances to what have you are just going to be part and parcel of our experience regardless of how um, spiritually progressed we may become. Would that be a fair yeah. sum- summation of what you just said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also, Arno used to say that people come, people come thinking they want truth, but very often they want to be happy, mm. right? And we want to be loved, and part of being loved is loving, right? Loving and being loved, and it's not inseparable from truth, but it's it's often it's often um, a deep, a deep part of our aspiration on the path, and we don't just want we don't we. We don't want to leave the world. We just don't know how to do the world in a way that right, brings insight and love. And, you know, it doesn't all happen at the same time. And bef- before we get too far away, and I know we're, we want to hone this in on the, the yoga and psyche project, as it were, but I use the example of our no, but I, I was recently visiting the ashram, Lee's ashram. I hadn't been there for a long time, and there was a visiting teacher, uh, a, a, a Tibetan, an American Tibetan lama, and and different than our no, he was um, his name was Troctum Rinpoche, and he was he was he was also speaking truth, but he was very he reminded me of Lee in, in the way that he he was giving refined teachings about I don't know whatever they do in Tibetan Buddhism the red the red dot how it separates from the white and the consciousness and and then he'd sit and say and don't you think that that exempts you from getting depressed. You know, now and then, and and he, you know, he writes songs about the blues, and he's like, I go through cyclical depressions, and just because you've mastered these kinds of teachings, don't think that it gets you, you know, it gets you off off the wheel of the things that happen to human beings. And he, he said it strongly and articulately with with a, a confidence and a, a transmission of truth that that again it warmed it warmed me yeah. because because. Maybe there's another way to, to consider the path where we just learn how to to open to it and digest and integrate right life. We have so much time to be dead. Um, I think one reason people have that sort of expectation a lot is you read the spiritual literature and it's you know all about Ananda and these blissful states that that you're supposed to be able to be in. And you know we kind of think, oh boy, if if I can achieve that, then I'll always be in bliss, and so there won't be any room for depression. But but again, I haven't seen any examples of it, and I've seen some pretty nifty people. I mean, I've seen some very blissful people, but they still seem to to go through the cycle of normal human emotions. Um, by blissful people, I mean like you know great famous saints and so on. Uh, they they still are prone to anger and tears and very and even depression. Uh, at least externally, it appears to be that, that that's their experience. I don't know what's happening inside. There may be an underlying foundation of bliss with the facade of of depression or or anger, um, but that's what the way it appears. The insistence. What is the insistence on favoring bliss? Right as as. I know that it's really, really pleasant, right? And and I'm a yogi, so we we like bliss. You know, the wonderful thing about yoga is that if you learn to practice in a certain way, you know, without drugs and and without you know getting to a cave in India, you can practice in a certain way, and you can invoke deep states of pleasure and and samadhi and different states of bliss and enjoyment and freedom i mean it's so wonderful right it's so wonderful but but any kind of insistence on on that being the the state that defines the spiritual path seems to to rule out the rest of life and going you know bridging to yoga and psychology we we get we find ourselves in a lot of problems we, right this year alone i was talking to to a friend recently. I mean, in, in the last 12 months, we've had three or four major, you know, yogic Buddhist scandals. I mean, I mean, major ones. Let let alone all the minor ones. And and I think that there is there is there is something that psychology has to bring to yoga, and you know, certainly something that that yo- we know that that these Eastern imports have something to bring to us. That's why. Right, more spiritual practitioners are studying yoga and Buddhism than Judaism and Christianity, and 
and and Native American spirituality. There's something, especially Buddhism, right? There's something so wonderfully accessible about them and the, the methods. And and yet, I know this is a familiar a familiar conversation, but if we look at where where everything breaks down in the lives of teachers and in the lives of communities and in our own disillusionment, which is fine if it doesn't take us away from the path, but it's unfortunate. I mean, it's fine if it brings us closer to the path, but it's unfortunate if it takes us away from the path. All of this occurs in the domain of psychology. All, you know, most mm -hmm. spiritual practices work well. And, and it's, it's not, right, it's not a problem that that's so. It's, it's just a question of, of how as Western practitioners we, we refine our understanding and approach to the path and our expectations and we, we understand our longing and, and what's involved and then we don't, it doesn't need to become a diso disillusionment. I was recently speaking on a, a show of some friends of mine, um, two wonderful yoginis, Ann Cushman and Janice Gates, they started the mindfulness yoga program at Spirit Rock. And they had a, they had a call in and, and the, the call in person said something to me to the effect of, are you trying to tell me that if I approach a new, a new yoga teacher or a new spiritual teacher that I should expect that this teacher, you know, might end up propositioning me for sex or, you know, might have, you know, some, some, like, some secret something that's going to pop out. And I said, you don't have to expect it, but you might want to be prepared for that possibility. And, and, and not, not in the black and white way, like that happens and I'm going to run for the hills, but be prepared. Like, how are you going to think about it? And how are you going to think about the human condition and your condition and teachers and the path so that you can optimize your practice and you can optimize the benefits that you're going to take from the teachers. And of course, none of that um, takes away from a teacher's responsibility and accountability for their actions, but that's what they have to do. Okay. And and most of our, your listeners are practitioners, so we have to we have to do what we have to do. Mm. I guess at this juncture we could reference your book, Halfway Up the Mountain, Error of Premature Claims to Awakening, and suggest that virtually everyone who is out there as a teacher isn't necessarily at the mountaintop, you know, and, and then ask the question, well, if they were at the mountaintop, and if there is a mountaintop, um, you know, would we expect impeccability, or could we still expect, or, or does sort of being a, a screw-up at times uh, even characterize life at the mountaintop, and 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 particularly right a, a discernment, which was the subject of, of eyes wide open. A discernment to make is is when when the teacher falls, what what happens there? How do they how do they respond? How they and how do it, they yeah. handle it? And how do they support their community through it? Because I think that whether that separates the whatever the wheat from the chaff, or, because. And, and, and separating when a teacher when a teacher really makes an error from when a teacher gets a divorce. People get so disillusioned with a teacher because they get divorced. I mean, human being that's not a teacher fucking up. That's that's human relationship going through its course and we have no idea, nor is it our business, right? All the variables that went into a teacher's divorce unless you know it's some public thing that is directly relevant to the teacher's effectiveness to the students. Mm. So I don't consider, I mean, marriages sometimes break up, right? We all, we all know that. So that, I want to just make that distinction because I, I have people you know, coming to me all the time devastated because their teacher got divorced and they don't know what to make about the tradition and the path and, and the lineage. And I, 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 um, I don't know, I've been a psychotherapist. People, people that happens in life. But, and distinguish that from teachers screwing up. Teachers screw up. They well, I, think, make I think the reason we're dwelling on this point so much from slightly different angles is and we can maybe make, make it even more explicit. There's an underlying assumption that enlightenment or, or self-realization or whatever you want to call it is some kind of idyllic state. And it's a state at which we've finally risen above um, the possibility 
of making mistakes. You know, we're kind of in tune with the cosmic intelligence and all of our action is going to just flow spontaneously in a life-supportive manner and we're not going to be doing anything which is going to hurt anybody in any way. And, you know, there are teachers who have explicitly explained it in those terms and a lot of people have taken that to heart and that's their expectation. So somehow that expectation either has to be dismantled or it has to be reconciled <laughs> with reality. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, right? So we haven't touched the subject of somatics yet or body-centered psychotherapy, which is most, most of what I do and, and the great link between um, bridge between psychology and yoga is, is, is the body. But because I've been studying it for so long, I, I experience a lot of life through the body. So when, when, you, when you describe that, I, 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 I feel nauseous. Nauseous? <laughs> My first response is like I get this nausea when you talk about the state. Where well, you've heard it, though. I'm sure you've heard that kind of explanation oh. of what it is, you know? I've not only heard it, but I think I get nauseous because I, I just perceive, I just feel the, the, the heartbreak and the devastation and the, the, the suffering involved in, in such a... In the, propagation of such a teaching I yeah. I hear that I because I I mean yeah granted you know it's my living so in some small way it you know it benefits me but I'm saying that really as, as kind of a joke but I, I hear that and and the suffering that takes place and it's just it's just not it's just a mis misunderstanding and it diminishes the path you know, it diminishes the, the radiance of the path and, and of life. And, and you think about such a teaching. I don't know why teachers would insist on propagating that. But you, you think about the suffering in, in the teachers themselves where they, they, um, as they, they experience the contradiction between that teaching and, and their, own, their lives. own lives. So they, they are, they're struggling with, with that and how to manage that. And and I you know I've talked to many of these teachers. I we got to meet up at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, and the the joy for me in those conferences is especially the year before last. My my son was like nine months old, so I spent the whole conference in the hallway, kind of talking to whoever sat down and played with us, and just enjoying the company because there's so many wonderful people there. And and the teachers would just sit down, and and these are the conversations we have. And and then not only are they struggling with the with the contradiction or the incongruence in themselves, but then in propagating those teachings, you're propagating or proliferate, pro, proliferating that that contradiction in students. And then those students are nurses and doctors and therapists and teachers. And then they of course want to do their part in bringing forth the teachings. And 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 then they have the same contradiction to work with, whereas if we considered um, in this moment, you know, just a working definition of awakening or enlightenment as, 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 as congruence, more like a Jungian, like a congruence with, with life and ourselves and the laws of the universe, which include you know, all the, the everything, it, it just gets more, more real, more honest, it gets softer. Right? Heartbreak is a beautiful thing. Heartbreak humbles us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was, I was actually going to ask you, okay, I was going to say if, if uh, this idyllic state of enlightenment doesn't actually exist, if we can't find living examples of it, present or past, uh, you know, then, then what's the best we can hope for? What, what, what would be a more honest, realistic um, definition of enlightenment? Um, and you started to answer it, um, and, and one in which we're not just kind of lowering the bar and selling ourselves short, but what it actually is, you know, what, what, what is actually attainable for a human being uh, in any reasonable or practical sense. Um, I think it's important to anchor down a clear understanding of that and perhaps help to begin to um, reverse this trend that you just described of people propagating a, a an unattainable ideal. Yeah, yeah, and and you know the the reality is, as far as I understand it, is that we don't we don't entirely know what is attainable for each of us in in this life. When when you say that, one of my yogic mentors was Robert Svoboda, who's a wonderful wonderful yogic scholar, and and he used to say that 
that you go you go deep you know deep within yourself and you conceive of of the and feel into the greatest possibility your deepest aspiration for the path and you you know you 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 envision and and feel into that from the deepest place that 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 you can and then you look at what's the next point and it's it's almost like a connecting the dots because because we we don't want to diminish the path and the possibilities and and so we you know we we hold to the deep the deeper vision and we keep practicing right we keep practicing in all the ways that life reveals to us to practice but i mean i can't talk to people about not not practicing there's so many ways to practice and and the non-practice approach makes zero sense to me but we 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 keep we keep practicing and and then because we the practice is greater than us right the the transmission and the the possibilities are are greater than than our conceptions of them so if we envision and aspire and intend and and then attend to the next step in front of us we hold we hold a possibility for what can become of right of each of our own in unfolding process and and yet stay really real with with what's in front of us. Mm. One thing that occurred to me when you said that is that um, one little syndrome I've noticed is that when, when people are really fixated on a, uh, a far-reaching idealistic notion of enlightenment, they, they very often belittle their own progress and feel like they are just light years away from ever attaining anything of, of real significance. Whereas what you just said, if we just sort of look to the next horizon and then f having reached that horizon, look to the next one, you know, we can kind of like uh, be more perhaps honest about um, the very significant progress that we may actually have made. Yeah, and the, the path is infinite. Like I, there's, there's so many things I can't can't say with total conviction, but I, I believe this. Yeah, you know, the, the path is infinite, and each human being is unique. Mm -hmm. And and if we really accept those simple things that most people could probably agree with, that they feel into themselves, if the path is infinite, that that actually means, and that we're unique, it really means that wherever we are on it is 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 perfectly okay. It's a point on infinity, and it actually can't be measured because because we have unique karma and unique gifts. So so it actually is okay. It might not feel very good. But but it 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 again it's just not true that we're not far along enough. It's it, that's in relationship to a projection and an idea and and it doesn't account for our our uniqueness and our gifts and and, and what what our lives can be. I came across a quote from St. Teresa of Avila in which she said that God himself is on the path. You know, he, he too is evolving. So I can't. That's beautiful. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. And if God had teenagers, you know, God would experience, <laughs> God would experience a certain amount of internal crisis and confusion about what to do in this situation and that situation. And God does and, have you teenagers. Know. <laughs> yeah. And God We're gets them. Cancer. God gets cancer and God weeps, you know, and, uh. and and an environmental crisis happens and God has anxiety attacks about it and doesn't know what's going to happen, right? When the earth <laughs> disappears and and where to go next and how to how to manifest itself in the widest possibility, right? God mm. itself. <laughs> So how are we doing on our conversation about God about you? <laughs> yeah, are we uh, are we starting to take off chunks and chew um, upon them uh, uh, in terms of this yoga and psychology um, discussion yeah. and, and, and just the core, the way this is unfolding are we hitting on some of the themes that you would like to discuss we're hitting on them but I, I after I get through wondering about you know poor God who doesn't have anybody to go to for therapy as we <laughs> consider that who does God go to for support I mean. maybe he'll give you a call after this I, you know, the show's getting pretty popular so you never know <laughs> <laughs> Poor God, right? Who does God get to go to for emotional support? And why shouldn't God get that and need that? I have no problem with that idea. <laughs> no, just no one available. <laughs> um, um, and I, I do want to, I, I do want to hone, hone on, hone in into that. I think this, this passion we share for this particular angle of the path is, it's so mm -hmm. inspiring. 
And just before we, we hone into some of the, the principles of, of yoga and psychology, which I think will actually be useful for a lot of your, your listeners, I, I thought again to um, one of, one of the, the greatest moments of all the interviews I did when I was a young woman, and I was interviewing Vimala, Vimala Takar, who was the late successor of, of, well, of Jay Krishnamurti. Jay Krishnamurti didn't have successors, but she was because they were in a non-successor type of path, but she was, you know, she was the one. And and at the end of this interview, she she talked about all the challenges in her life, and and then she said to me, for for every for every challenge that I that I encountered, I would say to myself, this is a love letter from God, to which I must find a response from within. And and it's like that maybe we're God's therapy, you know. It's like these these are the love letters, the challenges of our lives, and and, and we go inside and and look for the most congruent response we can find in ourselves, you know, as we are situated today with what we've learned and what we haven't learned. Mm. That's nice. Well, if God is really omnipresent, then uh, you know He. We are him expressing yes. through these apparent forms and growing as we grow and, and you know. And that's just so much more human and and it, it can really undercut so much self hatred and self negation and um yeah. So when you talk so, about yoga and psychology, are you talking about hatha yoga mostly or also the whole kit and caboodle? I'm talking about the whole kit and caboodle, and okay. and the people that I, that end up um, I end up working with are mostly yoga teachers or long-term practitioners in 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 this type of seminar. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people, I think that people people are when they're hungry for the path, they they very often end up in in right, yoga or Buddhism. You might know this stat better than I do, but yoga is probably the most popular choice of of a, a spiritual practice. I put that quotes because a lot of yoga isn't very spiritual and how it's offered, but you know, it's it's more more there than anywhere else. So people enter enter the path in that way. And they enter as we're talking about just with hopes for some relief of suffering and ideas of 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 bliss or, or peace or, or, or all the things that we come to the path with. And 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 then it, those who get deeply into yoga, as we were saying, discover that there's a lot of bliss to be found, and it's quite methodical. You can do, and especially physical physical practice, you you can really achieve certain states. And whether you, whether you're doing that through yoga or through um, a vipassana meditation or following the you know the neo advaita track, and and getting the the experiences that people like to get so much, right? What what seems happen for almost everybody after a period of time is we see that that, that isn't translating, that isn't having an, a direct translation into, into our relational lives, in vocational lives, right? It doesn't translate, it doesn't, none of that ends up, some of it, a little bit of that helps us be better partners and better parents and, and operate in the world and figure out how to share our gifts and how to make a living and how to enjoy friendships and how to minimize drama in our lives, but a lot of it doesn't. Mm -hmm. right? So there, there, that's when the, and it's been happening for, really for a long time since, since spirituality got imported into, into Western culture. A lot of the teachers, you know, from Jack Cornfield onward regularly integrate their stories of coming back from India and starting to date and, you know, just then throwing themselves into psychotherapy in a very short time because because all of those states of emptiness were not amounting to 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 these they weren't integrating into these other areas of life hmm. and of course one approach is to say then we leave the world but what does that mean it just means we're dysfunctional and can't make a living right and we and we're living like starving artists on the spiritual path which is fine if we want to do that but once people are 40 and 50 and 60 they're really interested in in and being able to have health insurance as they grow old, right? And to have health insurance, you need a good job or you need money, right? And we want to we want to live in a in a house where we feel comfortable as as we prepare for for later stages of the path. And there's 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 the world and there's the relational part of life, and those wounds 
right? Those traumas that were created in relationship are often best attended to and resolved in a relational context. And there's no shame in that. There's no failure of the path. There's no failure of us. So, so we get to this point where, where, where so many yoga teachers, you know, kind of are, they're starting, many of them are, are thinking like, wow, I, I wish I'd simultaneously done a psychology degree. Or if I had this knowledge, you know, I could serve my students a lot better. Because, because you, you just hit this point. I was talking to a, an old friend of mine who runs an Ashtanga studio in Barcelona. I love going to Spain and, and we were there. We always connect up and, and she's been on an Ashtanga for 20 years. So Ashtanga is a very rigorous practice. And she said, you know, she, she can go through the intermediate and advanced series of Ashtanga. And, and for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, Ashtanga is so rigorous. And when you talk about an intermediate or advanced series of Ashtanga, I mean, you're talking about things that, well, very few human beings can contort their bodies to do. So so you're go- referring to Patanjali's uh, eight limbs, right? When you say Ashtanga, or is, uh, it, is this a different thing? In, in this, in this way, um, Ashtanga yoga that was that was um, brought forth by Patabi Joyce. Oh, okay. So it's just a very popular brand of, of of yoga. People, most of the yogas that that are practiced came from Patabi Joyce and Ashtanga, or they came from um, they came through Shivananda, or they came through. Um, why is his name Iyengar? Iyengar, right? Or um, Desikatar. So they, there's just a few lines that that from which all the others were were birthed. But her point was that she she could go through all of these things, mm-hmm. and you have to do this intense breathing, and everything has to be coordinated. And she could be totally spaced out, you know, and and obsessing about about a psychological challenge, or still the the way that the fact that she was adopted, you know, lived lives and, and, and still maintains a, an alienation in her life. This is just an example of a, you know, a, a great yogi friend who is deeply honest about, about the path. So would you say that, um, the, that if, if practice doesn't translate into daily life readily enough or integrate into it um, very readily, can the practice be faulted or are you saying that um, Almost, almost always, there there should be some kind of um, therapy or some kind of uh, su- something to supplement practice in order to, to to take care of the areas which spiritual practice of any kind is not really capable of addressing. Yeah, and I don't I don't fault practice at all. It's it's more that. That we're importing Eastern Eastern practices into into a in, you know into a Western life, and sometimes the proponents of those Eastern practices are actually saying all you need to do is this, and everything else will you know seek ye first, and all shall be added unto thee. You don't have to sort of do the psychotherapy or anything if you do my meditation practice or my this and that. That's yeah, actually the teaching sometimes. It is, but, but those people very, very often end up the subject of some major spiritual scandal, yep. or they end up a role model like Amrit Desai, who fell and then you know followed his, his process of making amends and doing his own psychotherapy later and, and offering that example. I, the practice itself isn't to be faulted, and it's not that everybody who does spiritual practice has to go into psychotherapy. Some practices... Um, are, are learning and working to integrate that component in, into the into the practice. The, the point is that we're Western practitioners living in a very certain period of time, and no no amount of truth discounts the 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 also truth of, of duality, right? And the also truth of the arising of karma and in psychological terms human development. So we're Western practitioners who have been raised in in a, in a culture that that that. The Western psyche is different than the Eastern psyche, right? And most of us were raised in homes where where our parents were not psychologically integrated people who taught us how to work with with the whole world of emotions. Mm. And and you know, half of us came from 
families that were broken or they should have been broken and they, they weren't broken, right? There's a, <laughs> yeah. a trauma of the divorce and there's a trauma of people who raised where there should have been divorce and there wasn't divorce. Yeah, that was my you, situation. My, my, yeah. my parents were all saying, well, we have to stay together for the sake of the kids. And meanwhile, they created a hell, you know? <laughs> I know. And, right. But there, there's a trauma of parents who did not divorce, right? right. Being raised in parents who did not divorce. Yeah. So what you're saying is that Kipling, and, w- K- Kipling was right in a way, you know? Never the twain shall meet. There's, there, you can't completely transplant an Eastern spiritual practice into a Western culture and uh, without somehow n- supplementing it with Inter- well, integrating. Integrating. Yeah. integrating. So, so Western psychology, and again, we should talk a little bit more about psychology because it's, it's a word. <laughs> it's it's as, as useless as enlightenment until we talk about what we yeah. really mean by it because yeah, everybody like, has these ideas. In the I'd like to do that, sure. A lot of people are, um, you know, subtly against psychology, but it's the, the projection is as unthought about as our, that adds our projection of enlightenment. But, but, but it's just about integrating. If we're going to import, you know, what, what do the, the findings not only of, of the old psychology, but somatic, somatic psychotherapy and trauma research and neuroscience, right? What are the benefits of, of the Western intelligent Findings of, of, of the spiritual path have to add and bring to the path so that, that Western practitioners who are interested in studying spirituality, whether it's Buddhism or Advaita or yoga or, or even old things like the patriarchal Judaism, but they want to study Jewish mysticism, right? What do these things have to give to each other? And it, it, it is absolutely true, right? That we're, Every time must have been unique in history, right? That's the funny thing about we're in a unique time in history. Every time must have been unique in history because it was the only time, but we're in the one that we're in, right? And you and I are sitting in different states talking to people all over the world. It's so beautiful. You know, from our last interview, I, you know, I ended up with, with psychotherapy clients in, in these countries far reaching and we sit in the living room like this, you know, it feels like we could be sitting in the living room and 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 can can meet each other so so we and and you know most of my clients i rarely deal deal with if i don't have nepali clients or indian clients I, I i have european clients and 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 clients of you know who who were somehow formed in some variation of the western psyche and and there's no reason why the benefits of of you know trauma research why why, for example, here's a question for psychology, why when somebody can do all of this wonderful spiritual, um, you know, when they can hit all these high enlightenment states and they can even intellectually articulate what happened in their childhood, you know, they, they, they embrace psychology enough to do that, 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 that they're going along and they still encounter in their body these intense states of anxiety in relationship and, and will, you know, with the flip of a dime feel like they're they're in in a, a war zone right or their life is at stake this happens for regular people all the time why because because those things are stored in the body and and so so angling into our question about psychology psychology the, the psychology that i like to think about is the psychology that's that's being developed Right, Buddhism is 2,500 years old, and yoga is 5,000 or 10,000 years old, depending on who you ask. And Western psychology is, is you know, 110, or I haven't counted lately, 110 or 120 years old. And I, 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 I at the moment at least, am of the, I, I resonate with the idea that, that, that psychology is, is the West, it's, it's a, a Western offer, offering to the spiritual path. Mm. When, uh, when, practiced and developed as 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 is possible. So when I think about psychology, I think about the psychology that is is becoming and is becoming possible. Go ahead, Jenna. No, I, I really like what you're saying. I listened to your interview with Rick Hansen. I thought it was great. I'd like to interview him one of these days. He's a neurophysiologist or neuroscientist. And uh, there, I recommend you. You have an interview series going, don't you? And we we can yeah. link we can link to that. People might enjoy listening uh, to to the one I just referred to and to some of the others because you're talking to scientists about these kind of topics. Um, but I, I think you're kind of pointing to an, an one another one of these underlying assumptions, which is that you know the Eastern spirituality 
doesn't really have anything to learn from the West, that they are the masters of, of the spiritual, just as the West is the master of the scientific. But I think that both, actually, uh, can grow into a much greater wholeness by a, a kind of a marriage in which you know, the, the, all of our scientific understandings of the brain and, and so on are um, appended on to Eastern spiritual practices. And conversely, the, a lot of the Western scientific stuff, which is capable of destroying the planet, needs an infusion of, of spirituality, which perhaps the East can provide more, more so than other traditions. <clears throat> so it's, you know, as we grow into more of a global community through communications and transportation and so on, it seems like this, uh, this melding together is taking place with mutual benefit for all. Yeah, and where and where all of those things, this marriage actually takes place, is is in 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 the human body in each of us. So, so I think that that the most interesting development in Western psychology has been has been bringing the body into the picture. And it's not it's not a new development in many ways. You know, Reich was on it and got persecuted for it, and Jung talked about the body. So it's it's not that it hasn't been talked about, but the availability now of of or the increasing availability of 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 psychological approaches that that know how to work in the body. Right? And this is where this is where yoga and somatic approaches, somatic meaning body centered approaches blend so beautifully because because yoga has an entry point into the body or physical yoga practice. It actually starts to teach you how to inhabit the body and, and feel sensation in the body and feel consciousness in the body. It doesn't teach um, unless the you know, the yoga teacher was trained psychologically, it doesn't teach how to work with trauma and memories and relationship issues in the body but when you start bringing the two of those the knowledge of the two of those together you you get something really interesting so so the biggest shift in my life as a psychotherapist and my life as a spiritual practitioner was when all of this started coming down into the body right as as a psychologist i was i was going through a period of illness in my 30s and i called up a friend who was a somatic psychotherapist and I said, well, what is all the stuff about trauma and can I have a session? And I, I went and after my first session, I, I, um, I felt that all of the psychotherapy I'd been doing until then was limited because, because this man was, was taking it into the body. Mm. And, and similarly, I had been with Yogi Ram Kumar, I'd been with my teacher, I had done years and years and years and years and years of meditation and then I started getting really involved in asana because, like many people in meditation, you know, when it's at the level of from here up, there's it's hard to swim in. Mm -hmm. And for me, and how hard to learn how to swim in. And for me, the 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 rooting of physical practice and breath, like it it, it anchored the process of consciousness. So so when I could anchor my my curiosity of how I was formed and start to understand, perceive my trauma and my struggles through sensation in the body. And when meditation and consciousness could start to have a place to, 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 to find its way into the body, and we could start really um, digesting our emotional reactivity and our trauma in the body and, and start to, I mean, I find when you bring meditation into the body, so Reggie Ray is another person I He's one of my friends and elders who I'm going to be interviewing in this series I'm working on in yoga and psychology. He ended up splitting from his whole his whole tradition. He split off because he, well, I don't know exactly why, but but he he felt that meditation on the body, which was the name of one of his books, right? That that it had to go. It had to go that way. Mm -hmm. And and when we start, when we get excited, when we learn, and we have to learn it. Who teaches us this? When we start to learn how to experience consciousness in the body, and when we start to learn how to digest our emotions in our body, um, the 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 body the body awakens, hmm. and 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 this principle of endlessness we're talking about becomes a very practical. It's not it's no longer a concept. You when you start to be able to journey into the body and consciousness in the body, there. 
there. It's, it's, it's like the first time you discover meditation. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bottomless, endless possibility to awaken radiance and activity in the body. And it's really, really exciting. And it has implications that are very real life, like how our experience of sex is, right? That's important to us. And, and when we're experiencing emotions, hard emotions, the most effective way that I have come across in my whole life of working with them is learning to intelligently work with them in the body and you can actually process them. You don't have to sit for a week and think, why did I get upset in that moment? You can learn how to meet that in the body and, and largely, you know, work through it in five or ten minutes when, when you know what to do. So let's use that as an example. Uh, let's say you got upset and um, you work through it in five or ten minutes. What, what's the actual experience that's taking place there? Are you noticing a physical sensation in your heart chakra or something and you're letting your attention dwell on that and it's kind of dissolving through the attention? or What's happening yeah. there? Okay, so, so the mistake I've made in this interview so far, um, I just realized when you reflected it back was the five to ten minute piece because you know, I, I, I think I've spent the last ten years learning and studying and did a three-year training, you know, in order to learn how to work with something in five or ten minutes. And I think about all the neo Advaita listeners who like to do things really, really, really quickly or not at all. So that's why I said it was a mistake because we don't want to we don't want to get too excited about about um, quick fixes. So yeah, just, there, there are people who can climb Half Dome in a few hours without ropes, but. <laughs> don't, don't go out and try it. <laughs> we can, we, so, but I, I, we can, we can definitely address your question. But it's, it's something that we, we need to learn how to do. However, we're mm -hmm. going to learn how to do it, whether right. we study it in books and practice, or get in a study group, or we do a training. So, so what? So what? When, when after I worked with a somatic psychotherapist who was my friend Michael Klein, a wonderful therapist out here, I, 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 I went about um, trying to figure out what was the smartest somatic you know, somatic trauma training that was available and, and promptly putting myself in it. I did, I studied for three years in, in the lineage of Peter Levine, who, who developed this model called somatic experiencing. And it's one, one of, of a number of good schools available. And, and they, they might approach it a little bit differently, but, but that's the one that, that I studied in and, and have based a lot of my integration of, of yoga and, and somatic psychotherapy on. So, so the wonderful, a few of the wonderful things that, that I learned in, in that school of trauma, and it's not a spiritual school, but if, if you do your home, your spiritual homework and then you learn how to work with trauma, the trauma, trauma not like, um, just the rape that happened, you know, to this person or that person, but the trauma in a very broad definition, the, whatever happened that we remember or don't remember, that causes us, right, to clamp up and brings the anxiety and the insomnia. And, and often it's, it's something we don't remember, and I don't even think that we have to remember it, but it's so trauma in, in the sense that all of us experience. So, so when I did this training, we spent the first four, four long days in, in learning how to uh, experience a uh, a place of resource and pleasure and sanctuary in the body. So learning how to experience safety in the body. And, and the old schools of psychology and, the, and you know, and when we first started going to India, whenever that was, I don't know if you've been or not, but, you know, metaphorically, when we all first started going to India, <laughs> psychologically at that time, people were doing a bunch of drugs, hoping that they could relive everything all at once and get it done once and for all. Or, or they were, you know, trying these early cathartic schools. They were following Fritz Perls or, or doing the earlier forms of holotrope breath work where you just go for as much catharsis. I'm willing to endure as much pain and feel it all the way. Right? Just let me feel it and I'll feel whatever I have to and I'll lock myself in this room for three days and, you know, and, and, and fast until I feel this whole thing so I can be done with it. It's a marathon. Right. It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and it, right, and it never works. It just right. never works. Yeah. And 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 what 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 I learned and I'm thoroughly convinced of is that is that that actually through um, through safety and through the cultivation of um, love, pleasure, warmth, sanctuary as a 
physiological state in our body that, that, that that's the, the road through which we learned to 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 work with the trauma so so when we talk about these kind of states arising it's it's not going to be as as simple as going into the body and just shaking or feeling it's it's um, what I end up teaching people how to do is is well first it's about how to experience consciousness in the body because that's not a given right so how to enter into the body and experience the life of the body and the emotion of the body as as sensation in the body every every emotional state we experience has a physiological component every thought we have you know has a, has a has a physiological component so learning how to perceive the body so that we can start to to um, take states and and work with them in the body and and the process I don't I don't I don't want to undersell it by trying to put out a whole method because it, it's too quick um, it's the kind of thing where you know at the moment on the screen comes up you know do not do just pers- you know try these practices especially don't teach them you know without without some guidance or without some some knowledge or some study but 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 basically even even when you're in the, the hyper aroused state you're you're learning to um, to bring yourself to a, a state where the nervous system is more relaxed, and there's simple techniques that that help you do that, even even in highly activated states. And and then what we learn to do is to to dip to to dip gently into almost the outer layer of the traumatic states in the body for very very short periods of time. So and and you can actually metabolize them. I don't. You, you can digest them, mm-hmm. so it's 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 about cultivating a a place of of safety and and reprieve in the body, and then consciously dipping into the the states of of arousal or activation, and then dragging our consciousness out a bit and back into into a, a calmer state, and and dipping in and and out of these states, mm-hmm. and. You know, when I first started studying it, it's it's an hour process, and there's two people watching, and one therapist. But now I have a two-year-old, right? And I have experience with it, so that process is going to happen while I'm, you know, grabbing the diapers and a bottle of juice and walking to the car. But I, I, you know, you can train yourself to do it. And it's it, another point worth mentioning because hardcore spiritual practitioners, which you know, most of the people who, many people who listen to your show must be, and I certainly, from everything I know about you and myself, you know, that that's where many of us start. We we don't know about gentleness when we come in, and we're you know we're much more about passion and fire and burning our way into enlightenment and speed and the suffering of God if we're theistic, and and to actually be converted to a process of of gentleness and slowing things down and you know when I was young I didn't even think peace was very interesting I you look at all the words on the path you know passion and cutting through and I was peace harmony <laughs> it sounded boring and those those don't sound boring at all <laughs> anymore yeah well you know we were talking about how what western science can bring to eastern spirituality and when i listened to your interview with rick hansen he was talking about um, how the brain um, changes over time through experience and um i think i mean if you and if you think about it, state of enlightenment whatever it is is a uh you know, if it's a radically different state of subjective experience, then it must be a radically different state of physiological functioning. And um, and if you look at how the physiology is, how it functions, it doesn't turn on a dime. It doesn't undergo radical, you know, transformations in a 24-hour period or something. There's always a kind of a, a gradual culturing that has to take place. And so I think what you're saying is in tune with that fact. Uh, and you're, you're describing a method whereby that uh, cult, that physiological transformation can be facilitated in the right direction. And I know in my own experience, I've been meditating at least a couple hours a day for 44 years, and the whole process these days is is 
kind of like a CAT scan of the body to a great extent. There's always a sort of a noticing of what's going on here and what's going on here and, and sort of bringing awareness to that. And maybe that's not exactly the, what, what you teach, but I find it very, um, by the end of a session, I feel like I've just been physiologically rejuvenated and a lot of crud that had been hidden there has been <laughs> cleared out. And, you know, the whole thing is, is working more smoothly. And as you say, you know, there's probably no end to that, the, to the refinement uh, and purification and culturing that, that can take place, which is not to say that it's just sort of a hopeless, endless process that's never going to reach any fruition, but even if there are stages of, of fruition, milestones, if you will, and even a final one, if they're, you know, speaking hypothetically, there's still going to be refinement after that because the, of the, what the body is and how it functions and, and what, its capa what its innate capabilities are. I mean, let's say that the self has been realized with complete clarity and there's just this, you know, sahaja samadhi being lived all the time. Fine. Then, but then what? You know, can your, can your senses become more refined? Can your heart or emotions become mm -hmm. fuller? And what are the physiological correlates to that that have to change in, in order for that to happen? That's so beautiful, just how, <laughs> how you're describing that. You kept using the word fruition, and I kept seeing fruits. Uh -huh. Fruition. And, 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 and I was thinking, well, if, of course there's fruition and the I mean I was just imagining like bigger and juicier and more interesting fruits and your path comes to fruition what would you want to do you would want to taste more fruits and serve I mean imagine fruits that we don't even know existed who yeah. wouldn't want to sit there and serve and eat and share and know all the, the fruition mm -hmm. And and when we talk about the possibilities in in the, in the body, there's there's um two two things that come to mind. One in, in the a very brief period of my life where I was studying Jyotish Vedic astrology, which I really know nothing about, but I I was studying it for a short period of time. And and the astrologer who I was studying with conveyed to me, and I I actually under I I, I understood it at the moment when he was talking about it. He, he said that that the Vedas are encoded into the cells of your body. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's a whole book that's been written about that by a guy here who's sometimes here in, in Iowa, which is it's, it's called Ved and Human Physiology, and he correlates all the different books of the Vedas with different structures in the brain and nervous system. It's, oh, it's quite a fascinating thing. Nice. And right, we can, it's not just that the Vedas are encoded, right? The Quran has got to be encoded if you mm -hmm. practice it in Islamic, and the Old Testament's probably encoded into the cells of our body. Everything wise, mm -hmm. right, is encoded into the cells of our body. So when you talk about Right? How many people can talk about meditation practice like like you can? I mean, you it's your own experience of it, but but it's right. It's 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 when we consider that that all of the knowledge of the universe is encoded into the cells of our body. And let's take this with another with another experience. I'll I'll put on the table. I I went a few weeks ago back to Washington D.C. where I was raised, and my family moved away when I went to college, so I had never been back since I was 19. And and my brother came down, and we, we did a pilgrimage to the, the house that I was raised in for, for 18 years, and knocked on the door, and the people were very nice, so we spent about an hour walking through through this house, and and I had a, a just an experience that I had never had before in life, where every everything from childhood, every memory was just thrown at me at the same time as as many as could fit in the synapses of my brain were happening at the same time and they weren't necessarily significant things I remembered all the tools on my father's tool chest and how it was designed and what the plaque on the door to you know the closet was and how I used to go inside and make sure there were you know nobody sitting there before I went to sleep and I, I remembered the times that I was right that I was sick and stayed home and my mother took care of me and the ribbons that we tied on the little things from my bat mitzvah all at once, right? The radio and what it looked like and the songs that used to be playing while my mom was cooking, it all, it all just, you know, happened at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, and the horrible things, you know, and beautiful things, they just were all just being remembered at the same time, right? So that's a really helpful explanation of psychology as well. I mean, it's just there and it's in our body. So if these Vedas or your Koran or your New Testament, it doesn't matter, right? If that's encoded in the cells of your body and every 
trauma and every wonderful thing, right? It's, it's all encoded into the cells of our body. And then the body is just going to, I don't know, they're just two really piece, interesting pieces of information to hold at the same time. And, and it's a very reasonable explanation of karma as, as well. It's just, it's just there and it's there for the taking of consciousness. And why wouldn't we be taking all the skills of the very best therapies and, and, and trauma research and the best neuroscience and the best Eastern technology and the most wonderful people we can find to hang out with in our lives and the not wonderful people that we're given to hang out with anyway because they're, they're part of our lives and, and just take it on, right? As, as the, as the life that, that we're given for a very, very, very short period of time and, you know, aspire toward the greatest spiritual unfolding that we could conceive of. But we don't even know what that is anyway. But aspire, right? Hold that too. And, and accept the bad days, right? Where we just feel like shit and consciousness seems a million miles away and practice, you know, bringing all of our skills to that too. And just kind of taking it on. I, I can't really think <laughs> what else there, 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 there is, you know. And if our life is about our work and our vocation, then we do that. But it, it or our kids, but it just, just seems to be what the game is is about. Gives new meaning to that song. Your body is a wonderland. <laughs> I yeah. forget I forget the guy's name who sang that song, but it's yeah. like it's a. Uh, I guess that it's kind of becoming the focus of our conversation at the moment. But the you know there's that saying the body is the temple of the soul, and I think we're kind of elaborating the on that theme and, and kind of highlighting the significance of it. But you know the body is this you know hundreds of trillions of neurons in the brain, and it's this infinitely sophisticated mechanism, and we and and that's the vehicle. You know if if we're going to do anything in life. When I was like 18 years old and had been taking drugs for a year, I, I, I kind of had this realization one time. I was sitting there in my basement bedroom on acid reading a Zen book, and, I, and, and I, I, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Wow, you know, my body is, I'm stuck in this body, and if I damage it, I'm going to be stuck in a damaged body all my life, so I better really clean up my act here, and that's when I decided to learn meditation, but... Um, you know, on the on the positive side, it's this incredibly sophisticated exploratory tool the body is for discovering the, you know what the truth of life is and the and the meaning of life and the significance of the universe and so so many deep questions. They can all it's through this instrument. You know, if you think of spiritual practice as a science. You know, most sciences use instruments external to the scientist—a microscope, a telescope, a whatever—and you know, and some experiments take a long time, 15, 20 years, to actually reach some kind of conclusion. So, in this case, here's our instrument, and the the experiment might take decades, but it's continually yielding new knowledge as we continue to explore deeper and deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautifully said. Mm. And, and, I mean, then, then, I mean, we're going out into the cosmos, but we can, you know, we can, we can see how, I mean, for me, yoga has so much, you know, yoga has so much to, to bring to, to the awakening of the body and, and the somatic approaches, the, the body-centered approaches to psychology. They, they're, they're, they're such natural allies and, and aids in, in awakening the body. And we're, we are talking passion about the body, but I write a lot of listeners, and it's important to think about their, they might be listening like I was when I went to therapy when I was 23, and my therapist said that, she said, oh, you're really out of your body. And I had no idea what she meant. I had no idea what she meant. And and I, I remember thinking, well, what does that mean? And obviously, I'm supposed to be in it, but what does that mean? And right, and how do I get there? So, so as we were getting, you know, a little ecstatic, which I 
support and love about the possibilities, right? And then there's all of these people who are listening and saying, like, what is, how do I even know if I'm in my body? And I had to ask every couple of years, you know, somebody, am I in my body yet? I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Am I in my body yet? Like, well, how, do, how will I know when I'm in my body? <laughs> and, you know, it just takes a while. It takes some instruction. You know, it takes some, especially, I mean, some of us come in through paths that are teaching us to leave our body. And a lot of yoga, you, you go to the wrong teacher, and they're just teaching you how to leave your body and, and get further away from it rather than closer to it. So I, I just want to bring the... The, the remembrance that, that, that nearing the body, it's, a, it's not complicated and it's not hard and it's not really complex, but, but it, it has to be learned and taught and practiced. And a lot of times why people don't initially want to get near it is because initially when we get near it, right, all of, like when I was using the example of visiting my child at home, all that's there. So, so when we first, right, when we first start to look at ourselves, right, when we first start doing challenging introspective work, there's, there's a lot of gunk, right? We, when we first enter into the body, we might find for women a lot of shame. And a lot of women have a lot of hatred for their body, right? And men and shame. So, so there's, you know, there's, there's some layers of gunk that we're going to encounter. And there, the nice thing about, about the gunk is that even though it's really like thick and gooey, it can fairly easily be removed. It's, you know, it's not the deepest. Yeah. So, but but sometimes people, right? We don't we don't know how to, and and it's like there's there's stuff. But but we can. I mean, it's it's just it's really workable grounds. It's like you buy a, a new lot of land, and and to clear it is going to be a drag. But you spend you know two weeks, and you make a lot of progress. Yeah, and then you enjoy the land. Well, I was listening to your interview with Raphael Kushner, and and you you or he brought up some verse from the Bible about how if you don't face the stuff that's mm -hmm. there, then it kind of is your enemy, you know. But if you face it, then it, you're, it can be your friend. It can help. You, you can probably quote the thing. Yeah, yeah. It was it was. Um, I'm Jewish, so I rarely quote anything Christian. But it was um it was Gospel of Thomas, or it was Jesus, and he said um Thomas. He, Thomas, Thomas, and uh, he said, you know, if if you if you if you face that, that if you face that which is within you, it becomes your ally, and if you don't face, mm. it, which is what you said, if you don't, there's, face some, there's it, something like that in the Gita face. too, where if you know the self, then it's your friend, and if you don't, then it behaves with enmity like a foe. There's that verse, uh, yeah. and it's it's not only, I mean, it it it's really an ally because it's not it's not only cease is to be an enemy, but it, it becomes a great asset. And the way that it becomes an asset, right, as, as we grow up and grow older, most of us start to want to serve and give mm -hmm. something on the path, right? That's a, I think it's a, a function of development. You're, you're younger on the path and you just want to be free of suffering and you want to enjoy more and, and then, and then you hit, you know, 35 or 40 or 50 and, and you start to feel, a, well, well, what am I going to leave the world with? What can I, what can I offer? And it becomes, almost more interesting than what you can get because you've gotten a lot of what you can get, right? And, and then you start to get by being able to share and, and give. And, and when we face, when we face what's within us and we really know it and meet it and are humbled by it, right? Then it, then it becomes part of our offering. And just like you're doing with me in, in, in this conversation, it's like when we can use those experiences and not be ashamed of them or think less of ourselves because of them and we learn how to communicate them then other human beings which is what we all are then they can then they say me too right it makes it it makes the teachings accessible it's very helpful for people when a spiritual teacher will talk about when they had to go on meds you know which most of them won't and when they had their nervous breakdown and 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 when they were you know, when they got ahead of themselves and got inflated, it's really helpful for people because because it it says, oh, you're like me, mm. right? And and you've you've come a long way, and and that means that that, that I too, you know, like I'm made of the same stuff as you, and I have those kinds of experiences. So it makes it becomes when we face what what is within us, it it really becomes a an aid to our offering in life, whoever 
right, whoever it is that we're given to offer something to. Mm. One question that's been percolating up in the last 10 minutes is, um, you know, people are listening to this, and at, at a certain, I think at this point many people are thinking, all right, well, what do I do, you know? Should I book an appointment with Mariana? Should I go and find a teacher? But she's warned against teachers who just, you know, get you out of your body. And how do I find a... You know, some kind of practical application for all this. How you know? How do I do this somatic yoga or whatever, uh, so as to really you know get some benefit and not just have spent an hour and a half listening to a, a theoretical talk? Yeah, yeah, that's where I go with it too. So let's think about it together in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think if if people haven't done some some good chunk of psychological work in their life on the spiritual path while they're on the spiritual path or in their life or it's been a really long time or their relationships or their parenting or their anxiety or their depression evidences that you know it's time for an update I think that 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 people people should if if they want to gain the most benefits of, of the spiritual path that they should take on a good chunk of psychological work and, and that they should consider and ask around from the people that they know who are the, you know, who's the best person available that can help them with that, even if it costs a little bit more money because a mediocre or poor psychologist is, there, there's no discounts, just like in India, right? You pay if you want toast or toast with butter or toast with butter or jelly, you know, there's, there's no discounts in, in, in such a world. Fine, you know, I think people should 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 make sure that they've given their their psychological um, process some some good some good time. I um I had done you know in the course of my studies a lot of psychological work, but about five or six maybe six years ago, I thought I'm I'm due, you know, I'm due, and I I found the best somatic psychotherapist that I could find, and I drove an hour each way to see him, and I put myself there for three years, and I'm so grateful, you know, it just. It deepened my meditation, it deepened my yoga, it deepened my, the quality of our conversation right now. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that, that's an important to do. And um, I am I'm finding my way, as, as my friends have, um, into, into the world of, of, you know, multimedia. And I'm, I'm grateful for my interns to, to be helping me with that. So any day, I've been promising it for a while, but I'm... I'm going to be able to, I have a, a small yoga studio at, at my house here in California, but I'm going to be able to live stream things that I do so that I can make, I can talk to people at a, at a larger, you know, further, further away. And, and, and I think, you know, I think it is wise to seek out spiritual guidance. And, and we use these conversations and we, we use all the resources we have to try to make the most grounded choices. In, in, in who we seek help from. So, so if, if you're looking for, for teachers in your area or that you can travel to, and we're, we're, we're talking, I think, pretty convincingly about the value of the body and life and ground and relationship and its relevance to the path. If your teacher is telling you that, that, that there's a quick fix and that you don't have to practice or you know, that we're going to transcend all suffering, I, I would run the other way. Mm. And, and if, a teacher, if a teacher, by their example, by the long-term practitioners around them, and by what we feel in their presence is, is, is talking about something that is um, longer term but sustainable and, and has implications for, for human relationship, I think, I think it's a lot more interesting. And, and you know, I, I I never want to stop studying. I'm I can't wait till my son's old enough that I have you know, I'm dreaming of of finding a local Tibetan Buddhist teacher where I can just you know study meditation more deeply when 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 the next opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. So we want to look for for really grounded grounded teachers or grounded psychotherapists or grounded groups of to study with. And if we don't know what grounded means, because sometimes we don't, you know, we 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 enliven that question. And and when we're visiting, it's like, is is this person going to help me, you know, become a, a better person, a wiser person, a more caring person? Is this person going to 
you know, make, it sounds so cliche almost at this point, but help make me more human, fill, fill it out, mm-hmm. and to, to use the help of, of, of those kinds of teachers and, and to never think that we're, we're beyond um, help or need. And it, it doesn't mean anything less about us or the path or the teachers. It doesn't really mean anything. It just means that we're growing. Hmm. And to not expect to find a perfect teacher, right, because it's just a recipe for, for disaster at this point. You know, I wrote all these early books. I wrote a, two books about gurus, well, two versions of a book 10 years apart. So it was, it was really two books. And, and, you know, when I was 30 years old, because it was my doctoral dissertation, the first, Do You Need a Guru?, I was traveling in Europe and all around the States and talking passionately about gurus and and now always people so often write emails saying, you know, who do you think that I should study with? And and it's it's you know, especially I'm going to India, can you give me a lead to enlighten gurus? And I mm. I just I just don't know who to send people to. I I I more have to say, you know, there's there's a number of really wise teachers available and you know you're a bunch of them hang out in buddhism and some hang out in yoga and some hang out in advaita and some hang out in judaism but but it's it just feels a little different it's like more i never thought i'd live to the day where i would be talking about this and i'm hopefully only halfway through my life or less but it, it seems like we're in a, t- a team <laughs> See my teacher rolling over in his <laughs> ash made, I mean a grave in Samadhi Shrine. <laughs> but I think we're in a you know, a, a kind of collaborative teamwork process here where we really need to help each other and we need to seek the company of the wise and seek the company of wise peers and and not expect to find perfection and it's it's you know my teacher supported me even though I had different views than him so I, I really I just saw him I was visiting a samadhi shrine and then I just saw him flip when I'm talking about this collaborative effort. Well, you know, I mean, in the Vedic literature, there's often references to the value of being in the company of the wise, and I'm sure that's true of other traditions too. It's that that in itself is supposed to be a very potent technique, uh, just being in the company of the so, quote unquote enlightened. And um, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking. You know, r- rather than having to be able to give specific recommendations when someone says, "Should which teacher should I see?" I think if a more useful instruction would be to learn to be conversant with the kind of underlying principles we've been talking about um, in in terms of the, the, what you would expect in a teacher, uh, or what you should expect or and should avoid. And you know, if if those are taken to heart, then finding a, 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 an effective teacher will kind of be piece of cake, you know, just fall into place when you have the right orientation to know what you're looking for. Yeah, and 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 quite honestly, I mean, I, I, I spent like 10 years of my life producing three books to, to help people have that piece, that information. Mm-hmm. And so, so as we're talking about this, it's not vague. I, two books ago, I, I did um, Eyes Wide Open, Cultivating Discernment on the Spiritual Path, and not only did I put, you know, all the best of my learning into it, but I had the wonderful editors it sounds true who just you know whipped my butt for like two years of refinement and and there's actually you know I wrote three books basically helping practitioners um, get the information they need so that they can be wise you know wise consumers and and we we simply yeah we we refine our discernment we that's the value of knowledge right Mm -hmm. this we're talking about the body but right it's 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 inextricably linked to the mind and we, we, we continue to study and we deepen our knowledge and, and refine our discernment and and then it's it's not as as much of a jungle as we think. I'm not worried about encountering a scandalous or false teacher who's going to screw me over. I'm not going to. Right. I might encounter a teacher who, who does something stupid but I'm as long as I'm getting the information that I need from that teacher I'm I'll be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's there's ways that we 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 can learn we can learn how to to walk the path with diligence and of course we're refining it the theme of our, our conversation or one of them but but we can it's a it's a very learnable skill and a set of knowledge that's available to us yeah. and I would say that if somebody has 
been with a teacher that disappointed them or, you know, didn't live up to their expectations, then, hey, you know, even a, a broken clock tells the correct time twice a day, and undoubtedly you've gleaned something of value from that experience, even if it was to be, you know, sadder but wiser. But, um, you know, in my own experience, without getting into specifics, uh, I feel like, you know, I've moved on in, in, in a certain way in life, but there's been, there was a huge benefit from everything I've been through, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, um, you know, it's like Mick Jagger said, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Yeah, and we have the choice to make value of what we're given. We definitely do. And to write this, the, the tantric path, teaches us that all aspects of life can be used for transformational benefit. We just need to learn how to um, how to do that and to, to choose. Yeah, to choose and, don't, to do that. and don't let and, that tantric principle be a, an, uh, an excuse for indulging in <laughs> all kinds of hedonistic things, it, but that's not the spirit in which that was meant, I don't think. Yeah, well, that's not what tantra is. You know, that's no, no. Just, that's just the misconception of tantra. But yeah. But, and you know, and if we're stuck on certain aspects of what happened to us with the teacher, you know, that, then you do the therapy. I, I mean, I, I work with that all the time. I work with, with, with fallen angels, you know, the, the, the fallen practitioners or the fallen teachers. And, mm -hmm. and if there's trauma, then you can work through the trauma so you can reap the benefits. It's, it's all really doable. Yeah, yeah. It's really doable. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of... Uh, getting to the point where I feel we should probably wrap it up but um, it's so enjoyable talking to you and each thing you say elicits another thought but um, you know if we really do conceive of God as being omni omniscient and benevolent you know then in the, in the big vast ultimate picture everything we go through has some value to us it's, it has, it's meant for our growth it's not you know God doesn't doesn't play dice with the universe he's not capricious he's not cruel there is some kind of loving hand even if we're it's scrubbing behind our ear and it, mm -hmm. you know causing us discomfort and we're screaming out and as you know to use a metaphor with your child but mm -hmm. there, it's it, ultimately everything is meant for our our development and evolution yeah. At least yeah. that's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And we, 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 we learn. We learn. We, we choose to make use of it. But sometimes we have to do a certain amount of work to get enough freedom to, to be able to choose to do that. Mm -hmm. And we choose. We choose to do that. Yeah. And Rick, it's so enjoyable to have these conversations. I'm so happy I get to have them. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. I, I hope we've covered all the things you wanted to cover. Is there anything we've left out that you feel is really important? Um, I guess the, the, the one thing is, is really just what, what I'm doing now. Okay. Um, Tell us about which, that. Which is, which is this, this yoga and psyche, I'm calling it the Yoga and Psyche Project or the Yoga and Psyche Integration Project. And, and, and I um, kind of haphazardly like, put out a little note in one of my newsletters that I was looking for a, a research assistant because I wanted I have this book that's pushing its way through but I don't have the time I used to have because I have a young child and and I I got flooded you know I got flooded with offers for help and I'm saying that now because I would like to continue to be flooded with offers of help if, if people are listening to this I can't take all of it but I, I decided to take a bunch of it and and, and they don't and, have to be in California they can be anywhere yeah, yeah. okay yeah and I, I got I got these skilled, you know, younger and older people who who wanted to participate and 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 I found myself with what I call a good problem. You know, I, I didn't know what to do with them. And then we, you know, we pulled ourselves I pulled everyone together and started learning what people's gifts were and who was willing to do um, what was needed and who was only willing to do what they wanted to do because not that many people can research one book. And we, we created a, a project the, that, that corresponded to the size of, of the people who wanted to contribute. So, so, and this is just the last six months. I just kind of fell in my lap. So suddenly with all this help, we have, you know, we, we're, we're doing academic research. We're designing a, a quantitative study on, on the, the yoga and psyche method I'm developing and how it actually is going to work and how it translates into an EEG scan. And, 
and we're making a user-friendly workbook so that yoga teachers can learn how to can get some basics on, on how to work psychologically with their students and and I'm writing a book on the subject and 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 with all of this help people can bring their their gifts and really you know like eight nine minds they're they're just much more than one and mm -hmm. and and part of the living research I'm doing so the the point of this project that we're at now is just I think yes uh, Saturday I released the first dialogue that I'm doing with with different psychologists, yogis, neuroscientists, and trauma researchers on the subject to to learn to learn more. So when I was a young woman doing these books, I'd travel all around the world to meet these people and interview them. And now now I'm grown up, and we have this technology. So yeah. not only can we just do it like this, but now we can share them. So I'm I'm calling it living research, and and part of what's alive about it is not only are can people listen to the research as it's happening. But one of my interns uh, set it up so that people can contribute and you know bring their bring their comments in and and bring their experience in so that 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 we can actually gather the thoughts and input of 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 all of these people on the path who are listening and participating and that becomes part of the research. So it's this really. I'm just at the beginning of it, so I'll have to tell you in next year. You know, yeah, <laughs> what's come out of it, but it's it's really a way to let people. Who are you know equally skilled and as committed to the path? They're just not doing this public thing. Um, contribute their their insights and thoughts and skills. Cool. So that's what I'm that's what I'm doing these days when I'm not, when you're not being quiet and and mothering, which is what I'm doing most of most of most of the time. Good. Well, I'll be uh, I'll be linking to your website from bathgap.com, and people can go in there and. Sign up for your interview series and your new your email newsletter, and I guess you're you're alluding to the one you did with Rick Hansen. That's the one you published on Saturday, right? Which which yeah. I listened to is fascinating talk, and um, and they can get in touch with you if they'd like to engage with you one on one or you know participate in whatever way works for them. Yeah, yeah. Good. So and that's what is it? Real spiritual. Real spirituality. Real spirituality. dot com. dot com. Okay, and I'll be linking to that anyway. Or just yeah. my name. We can. We can. Yeah, if you search for your name, Mariana Kaplan, then th that comes right up. Great. So let me make a few wrap-up points. Um, I've been speaking with Mariana Kaplan, and I'm, I'm sure we'll do this again in a year or two or whatever. And then maybe next time you release a new book, I'd like to have another conversation with you. And um, this is part of an ongoing series. I've done over 150 of them now. There's a new one pretty much each week. Uh, if you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, go to bathgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump, and they're all archived there. You can uh, s sign up for an email newsletter to be notified each time a new one is posted. There is a discussion group there which crops up around each new interview, and um, last I looked, there are about 150 very intelligent uh, posts from last week's interview, and, and so uh, feel free to plunge in and participate in that way. There is a donate button there, which I very much appreciate people clicking if they feel the inclination. It helps to make this whole thing possible for me to do, and I actually hope to somehow move it into being a full-time gig, um, mm. ho hopefully without having to restrict access. It, it would be nice if it just there were enough donations that I could just do it and not have to sort of say, yeah, get out of pay to watch them or something. It, that, uh, that rubs me the wrong way. Um, and uh, there's also an audio podcast, which uh, if you'd like to listen to things like this while you're commuting or whatever, you can sign up for that and get it on your iPod or your MP3 player. Um, next week I'll be interviewing Kurt Johnson, who's wrote a book called The Coming Inner Spiritual Age. And the week after that I'll be f interviewing Dr. Fa uh, Father Thomas Keating, who's about 90 years old and uh, also is uh, sort of a big player in this whole inner spirituality discussion that's taking place. So, thanks, Mary. Hey, Rick. Before we, uh, those are beautiful projects, and I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so happy for your success. So oh, I want to, I want to say that, and I, it just occurred to me, and I'd be happy to do this or somebody else. So, I think one of the interviews, if it hasn't been done already, should be with you about your experience, right? And in, in, in what happens, like when I went back to my house and got right flooded by all these memories, your experience of encountering all this knowledge, I think it would be, I, I, I propose you being one of your guests. 
Uh, it's been proposed before, and I okay. actually, uh, Phila did interview with me a couple of years ago, and perhaps I can do it again one of these days. I'm always a little reluctant because I don't feel like I'm some kind of enlightened teacher, you know, and I, and. Neither uh, is anyone else in the interview. <laughs> yeah, right. I just sort of feel like, hey, I just this guy is good at asking questions. What, what have I got to say? That's everybody else is. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we'll do that sometime, and you'd be a good one to do it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> blessings for the project. All right, thanks. So I'll see you again in thanks. person pretty soon, hopefully, and maybe next fall at the Science and Non-Duality Conference. Okay, so long. Good, and thanks to everybody who's been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.